30 to 6 on checkpoint. Former National MP Marilyn Waring agrees donations to political parties should be made public. Marilyn Waring's unimpressed with politics these days. Since 1983, she hasn't belonged to any political party. But from what she's seen, she thinks that now a lot of effort's put in by companies to get the ear of whichever party's in power. I think the thing that sickens me most is that, you know, there wouldn't be a situation where um, someone from the Salvation Army or a Women's Refuge or a Rape Crisis Centre or the Māori Women's Welfare League, etc., would be invited to a lunch, you know, at $100 a plate to meet with a minister. I mean, what, what these kind of events mean is a more and more exclusive elite access to ministers. Well, what the company is buying at that moment is access to that minister in the future. Former MP Marilyn Waring. Turning to the finance. Gold in Hong Kong, the opening price in US dollars is unchanged at $339 an ounce. The interest rate for five-year government stock in the secondary market is 7.18%. That's down 0.02% on last night's close. The New Zealand dollar was buying 54.12 US when I was writing If Women Counted, I'd get up very early in the morning and at the window the grass would be covered in dew. All you could hear was the wind in the trees, the waves, and the sea and the sky were so clear and blue, and the beach would be empty. When I'd look around the view, you could see the hills rising out of the sea. But when I look at them, just untouched, and they look so beautiful, apparently they're of no value at all, at least according to the economic system. In Canada right now, we've just signed a free trade agreement with the United States and Mexico. We hear that it's a whole question of productivity. This is going to be good for economies. This is going to boost our GNP. We look across to Europe, and the same thing is happening in Europe. The mass tre treaty is signed, and all these countries are saying, well, yeah, this will be great for, we'll be coming together. This will be good for our economies. How does someone like you react to that? Well, it, it, it might uh, change GDP figures. But you're starting from the wrong premise. I mean, all of these decisions were based on the wrong figures in the first place. For 10, 20 years, we've had these cliches, we've heard this rhetoric, you know, inside or outside discussions on free trade. You tell us things are getting better, it's perfectly obvious to us. Our air is getting worse, our education systems are failing the poorest people, there is more poverty, there is more homelessness, there are more housing crises. We might well have growth, you know, you might be proving it to us. But when I, or we, look around our communities, we can't see this being realised. In fact, maybe we don't believe it. And I suspect that the unease that is in Canada and in the United States, and let me tell you, in Mexico, <laughs> about NAFTA, um, has to do with the fact that it doesn't matter what they say, GDP might grow up, but GDP is utterly unrelated to the well-being of a community. It tells you nothing about levels of poverty. It tells you nothing about the distribution of poverty. It tells you nothing about primary health care, educational standards, environmental cleanliness. And folks have realised that this unidimensional economic fabrication just doesn't bear any relationship to their lives. Yeah, well, but what you're saying, I don't even know if the word radical can contain it, because you're saying all of these ways of looking at economics and the way we discuss trade and productivity up on a blackboard, you just wipe it clean. Well, I hope the word radical does encompass it, actually, because it comes from the Latin derivation radius. It means from the root of things. It was 1975, it was International Women's Year, I was 22 years old and I put my name in and sort of six weeks later, with some horror, <laughs> recognised that I'd just been chosen the candidate for a safe seat, that I couldn't lose. 
honorable members of the House of Representatives. You meet here today as members of the 38th Parliament. Please notice the motion, Rennie. Are you? Yes, yes. Noting with amazement that all those wonderful legislative changes proposed in the women's area weren't mentioned in the speech from the throne. When you came in the door, of course, you should always bow to the speaker. Mm. And then, going to your seat here, uh, I was a feminist and I thought women should be in office, but I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be a classical musician. Yes, I'm not sure whether they've put me up here to keep me quiet or so that I'm nearest the door. My constituency was almost everything you can see. Basically, the farmers around here really work with the earth with the forces of nature. So you can see lots of shelter belts retained, um, lots of, uh, of planting of trees, um, not too much scarring of the landscape. It's a wonderful topography here. It's a wonderful shape. It was from the west coast it uh, included most of the, the hills and the mountains in the Waikato Basin, so I was quite particular about what was going on in the higher areas. Uh, you know, quite a number of us old-timers were fairly apprehensive. We'd heard a bit about this young woman and, uh, and her beliefs and so on, so we were a little bit apprehensive about what we were going to come across. They were extraordinary moments for me because uh, people were calling me a radical feminist and uh, here I was in a constituency that was rural, it was white, it was property, it was extremely conservative and I was working with predominantly men and I realised then there's nothing radical about what I'm saying at all. Um, not in the context of, of land like this, not in the context of values that this land teaches you. It was in the summer, towards the end of, of um, February, I think it was, and I think we must have been making some late hay, and uh, this long-haired young woman knocked on my door and said that she was Mara Waring and I knew who she was. She said she was looking for support for candidacy. and. Um, I said, well, look, if you don't mind waiting a minute, I'm just making some scones to get out to the, to the men in the field. And my daughter woke and was very fractious, and I couldn't do that and look after her and look after the scones and the orange juice and the sandwiches and things like that. So Marilyn, bless her, said, um, well, come on, Susan, we'll take you out to the garden. They picked the uh, white butterfly caterpillars off my rather eaten cabbages. So and kept her out of the way while I finished doing what I was doing. And then afterwards, we sat down on the step, the cold orange juice, and uh, I said to her, I've, I've never done this sort of thing before. I don't know what sort of questions to ask you as a delegate. And um, she said, well, I've never been a candidate before, so I can't help you. <laughs> it was really exciting. Um, the hall exploded for those of us who were supporting Marilyn. It exploded with cheers, and we felt as if we had done something really very exciting. Of course, we had. Um, and she went on from there to be a very strong, certainly strong person for women's rights, but a conscience, really, for, for those who are less fortunate. And I loved watching the conservative men of the electorate absolute, absolutely sort of hang on every word she said. Oh, come on. Oh, come on, they did. You were one of those, yes. <laughs> I, I don't know that she ever turned down anybody or left an unfinished job. But there were Maori problems as well as if there was anything that she thought would be of interest to us or we should know, she came and told us. And that was a new approach, eh? That, that somebody cared enough. We didn't have to go to Marilyn, she came to us. I don't suppose, uh, Marilyn, that you'll speak before your um, uh, maiden speech. No. And, and I'm sure you won't have any problem about this. Uh, you've had a good lot of experience, and I've watched you, and I'm absolutely confident that you'll have no trouble at all. 
It doesn't make one any less nervous. <laughs> Perhaps that's so, but I, I'm confident that you'll manage it all right. Dad, yes. could you find a piece of paper and a pen on the desk, please? Yes. And write out on it so I can read it, because I've forgotten to put it at the beginning of my speech. I realise that I am the youngest member of the House, and I would not presume to teach any members of this House anything about politics. <laughs> but members should be well aware that occasions will arise when I feel that further representation should be given to the point of view of the youth and the women of this country who are grossly numerically underrepresented in this House. Yeah. From time to time, when I feel a pressing need to advance the interests of those two groups, I will do so. Yeah. Every woman in New Zealand knows about Marilyn Waring and offers up a small thanks to her for making it that much easier for them. I think that's Marilyn's um, uh, plaque, if you like. It may not be set in metal, but it's written on many women's hearts, I know that. There's um, a phrase in Māori, Tūranga Waiwai, uh, a place to stand. And my constituency was my place to stand. I mean, I came from here. You couldn't shove me out of here and you couldn't tell me what the people here wanted. You know, I was one of them. And uh, so I had a real legitimacy because this was my Tūranga Waiwai. the mid-70s, New Zealanders had begun to demonstrate against the visit of uh, nuclear-powered or nuclear weapons-bearing ships to New Zealand. Well, the nuclear ships issue wasn't just a matter of not having nuclear weapons in New Zealand. It was a whole question of sovereignty. Here on the wharf in Wellington, by treaty, New Zealand was prohibited to store, possess, transport, use nuclear weapons. This seemed to me to be uh, treated with utmost contempt by a so-called ally, the United States, who would draw ships up alongside our wharves, you know, that were nuclear powered or that would have nuclear arms on them. And the only connection we had with that industry was the harbouring of these boats. And so if we were to do anything, the least and the only thing we could do was to ban them from New Zealand, from our territorial waters, from beside our walls. New Zealanders felt this very keenly. They didn't just feel it keenly as a, as a peace issue. They felt it very strongly as an environmental issue. I lived on the hills behind the harbour here. I used to run to work every morning and I remember the mornings I used to have to run past the warships here and I would just feel this knot in the gut of my stomach and think we just don't want them here. I mean there must be a way in which a people can say that. There should be no nuclear weapons inside our sovereign territory. Those were the words of an MP who wouldn't back down, and that was the conviction that led to the Prime Minister admitting he couldn't count on her vote on the nuclear issue. The government had been re-elected with a majority of only one. But, you know, under the Commonwealth system, there are only two matters of confidence on which a government can fall if they lose in the House. One is on the economy, and the other is on matters of national security and defence. No, you can't govern on that basis. You've got to govern with a certain majority. Close to midnight and in high spirits, the Prime Minister with the announcement that shocks the nation, a snap election. There's a sense of urgency about Parliament by now. I just withdrew from the government on the nuclear legislation and it forced... Uh, an election, forced an urgent election. Sir Robert blamed Waipar MP Marilyn Waring for not guaranteeing her support for his late night ride to Government House and the dissolution of Parliament. 
In almost three terms, she's crossed the floor more times than any MP in New Zealand's recent history. But it's been a long and often lonely fight. For two of those terms, she was the only female government MP. On some issues, she's made enemies, and during the nuclear debate, her political energy was running dry. Our attempts to contact Marilyn Waring today have been unsuccessful. She hasn't been in her office all day and appears to have gone underground. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did, quite frankly, I didn't agree with it. Um, but there you are, it happened and, uh, you know, you've got to respect Marilyn for her, her dedication and her beliefs. And as I say, that's democracy working. Um, that's a prime example, isn't it, that, you know, uh, one person like that can bring the government down. She had the majority of people saying, well, good on you, Marilyn, for saying the things you are saying, and that she had a reputation for being fearless and speaking her mind, um, which I think was... It, it, ordinary people appreciated that very much indeed. The election was fought on Nuclear Free New Zealand, and it was a resounding victory. 72% of New Zealanders voted for it. Did you have any doubts when you walked across that floor? You knew that, that the government that was in power, the government that you were a member of, could, could fall. Sure. I mean, but that's what you said. I mean, it, it always amazed me that that's not what members of parliament realise they're there for. I mean, there ought to have been 86 other people sitting there thinking that. That's our job. It seemed to me. I mean, if you're elected to go represent the people, you ought to be ready at any minute, at any hour, at any day to go on principle. It's not a job for life. You know, it's part of the job description is that you go <laughs> on principle, not sit around and wait until the polls kick you out. Got to stand up on high ground. The constituency was in good hands. Catherine O'Regan had taken over my old parliamentary seat. So I had some time for intensive research, and I set off to try to unscramble the codes of global economics. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the second Dubai International Aerospace Show. I think everybody has been staggered by the enormous success of the event this year, with comfortably over 400 companies exhibiting from all over the world, widespread all over the The international trade in arms is the biggest growth industry of all. The five permanent members of the Security Council are also the five leading arms exporters in the world. Out beyond 10 kilometers. Yes, sir, at night. Yes, sir. And daytime beyond 15 kilometers. Excellent mass-mounted sight. Killing people, or preparing to kill them, is considered very valuable in the international economic system. Arms exports account for more than half the trade surplus of the developed economies. But the death, homelessness, injury, poverty and starvation caused by the use of these weapons is not even registered as a deficit. If a country develops an economic system that is based on how to pay for the war, and if the amounts of fixed capital investment that are apparent are tied up in armaments, and if that country is a major exporter of arms and its industrial fabric is dependent on them, then it would be in that country's interests to ensure that it always had a market. It is not an exaggeration to say that it is clearly in the interests of the world's leading arms exporters to make sure that there is always a war going on somewhere. And pulling, Steve Martin pulling hard into a very tight radius, 360 degree turn, pulling 
9G at least, demonstrating the aircraft's complete capability of maneuvering at very high G and very high thrust. You see him demonstrating the full capability of fly-by-wire. He has got the stick hard over in one corner of the cockpit, the rudder hard over in the other, and the computer is essentially checking the aircraft in a steady spiral descent, not allowing it for one minute to get out of control. Now, the great importance of this in any combat aircraft is that it frees the pilot's entire attention from looking out of the window and at what he's supposed to be doing, which is attacking the enemy. The capability of the aircraft removes an enormous workload from the pilot. War is marketable. War pays, literally. War contributes to growth and development. The amount of money spent on armaments in just two weeks could provide safe water for the entire world. Well, these two children are uh, photographed in the Philippines the morning after a, a really rugged storm. The job for these children, they're not playing. They're down here trying to fish whatever might be usable for their families out of all of this debris, this putrid stink. And I watched them for hours, and they fished little bits of clothing, things like an old door handle out of the water and put it in their treasure bag, ready to take home. But this kind of water is, you know, a bearer of major diseases, of river blindness, of all kinds of typhus. Very close to where I took these pictures, there were families, 12, 14, of them sleeping in something not much bigger than a shipping container. And with several hundred dependent on one sort of broken down pump uh, for any water that they might need. The Philippines can be seen as a microcosm of the entire developing world. These are the hills overlooking the port city of Cebu in the southern part of the Philippines. It's a rural area which has been left vacant by an absentee landowner. A group of families have moved on to this land and built their huts and established a community here. Most of the men only get sporadic jobs or they provide cheap labour for some of the large cash crop plantations around the country. So it's really up to the women themselves to provide for the children. The average Filipino woman has eight children to raise and no access to abortion, family planning or divorce. You can imagine the anxiety that a mother of eight must feel if she doesn't know where she's going to get enough food to feed them all every day. This is the reason that women in rural areas all over the world grow food crops or raise farm animals. This sort of farming is usually called subsistence agriculture. It doesn't involve the exchange of money, but it does ensure that these children will eat. The World Bank would argue that to change the conditions of life for these people requires export growth to make room for productive exporting enterprises. These unproductive women and their families would simply be kicked off the land. The new company could then take further advantage of the homelessness it had helped to create by getting cheap labor here. 
This resourceful mother has managed to keep her family together by moving right into the city garbage dump. These cardboard boxes are home to her family of five. Here, the entire family can work collecting scrap metal or plastic or whatever can be sold to the junk shops in order to buy food. The cycle of poverty begins to repeat itself very early, as the eldest girl in a family at age eight or nine is expected to give up school and look after her youngest siblings, while her mother uses that time to do whatever she can to keep her family alive. Older boys may be left to fend for themselves and to sleep in the streets. Jennifer and Renren Ren are 10 year olds. They're just two of the children available through this Japanese brochure, which sells men only tourist junkets to the Philippines. Recent studies in Thailand, which also has a lucrative business in female sexual slavery, have shown that 70% of the women and girls have become infected with the HIV virus. Those who sexually exploit children are counted as doing productive work, increasing economic growth. Even if their activities are illegal, they're considered valuable enough to be in the calculations because they're income generating. Thanks to multinational monocrop plantations, the Philippines is the 14th largest exporter of food in the world. And yet 80% of the children who live here can't get enough to eat. <laughs> 17 million children in the world die each year from diseases that are related to poverty. Two thirds of these deaths are preventable. Take your money, keep it, don't tell me who to become. Take your age-old wisdom with you to kingdom come. Degrees and all that education won't help me where I come from. Born and raised in a country beside the river, my home. Born and raised in a country Beside the river, my home And ain't life sweet When we know what we're doing Ain't life sweet When we're not afraid to care Ain't life sweet When we know what we're doing Ain't life sweet When we're not afraid to care 